All right, I appreciate being out here this morning. I appreciate the invitation to come and preach. It really is a, an honor to come and get a chance to meet everybody here. I'm looking forward to meeting everybody more after service and going out soul winning this afternoon and coming back this evening. So I uh, appreciate you all being here. And the, the sermon that I have prepared for this morning, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and thinking about preaching here and trying to think of what you guys would need as a church and just praying about it and stuff. And honestly, the, the sermons I came up with for this morning and this evening, I really want to just preach at, our church, at my church in, uh, in Atlanta because th these are just truths that, that are great for everybody. So hopefully that you, you, know, you can find something that, that is really going to be helpful this morning, this evening. And what I want to start with this morning is something that definitely applies to everybody. But I was kind of thinking maybe specifically with your church, this church is a young church. This church has gotten off to rocky start. There's been all kinds of different things that have come up and hardships. But here you are, you still remain, you're still going strong, and uh, I want to try to be an encouragement this morning and also just kind of help look at Scripture and see what the Bible says about all these things. And the title of my sermon this morning is called Battle Fatigue. Battle Fatigue, you know, get, there's a, a, it's easy to get tired and to get weary with the work especially when you're dealing with persecutions, you're dealing with other problems, you're dealing with drama, there's all kinds of things going on, all kinds of attacks. It could be easy to start getting weary, start getting tired, but I'm here to encourage you this morning, and I want to start, we started off in 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, because there's, a, there's, there's many different ways that we could think about the Christian life. There's never just one aspect of the Christian life that this is what it's all about. One of the aspects about the Christian life that we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 is that we're, we're actually soldiers for Christ. And we see Timothy specifically is given a, um, a, an epistle here from the Apostle Paul. Of course, Timothy was an elder. Timothy was a pastor of a church. And um, he's given this instruction here. And he's told that he is a, uh, you know, as a soldier of Christ. Look at, look at verse number 1 here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Bible says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So he's referring to Timothy here and explaining that he ought to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ and that you need to be ready to endure hardness. Now, this isn't, I don't believe that being considered a soldier is just for Timothy. I think this is for anybody who's willing to get in the spiritual fight and the spiritual battle and do a little bit more than just show up for church on a Sunday morning, right? People who just show up for service, great, you know, if that's you, God bless you for being here. I'm glad that you're here and, and I want you to learn and grow, but hopefully you can decide to become a soldier and really get involved in the spiritual fight and the spiritual battle that's going on. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, if you would. And I'm going to read a little bit more from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because Apostle Paul is bringing to Timothy's remembrance some of the persecutions that he suffered. That's why he tells them, hey, endure hardness. In verse number 8, the Bible reads, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. He's saying, you know, just because of the gospel of Christ, because he's preaching Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, this is enough for him to suffer persecution. This is enough for him even to be thrown into prison. There is great power in the gospel. It's a power of God unto salvation. And this is why, you know, the enemy... The children of the devil and the devil himself don't want that being preached, which is why he's willing to go at any length to make sure that the word of God is going to stop, that the gospel is going to stop being preached. And, you know, you may not have picked this battle. You may not have, you know, signed up and said, yeah, I want to fight. But you know what? By getting saved and, and becoming a child of God, you are in the fight. Whether, whether you like it or not, you're, you're there. And now we've got to deal with where we're at, okay? And you want to, you know, if, if you love God, if you love the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin, to save your soul, and you love other people and you want to see them get saved, you know, it's time to step up and become a soldier for Christ. 
It's time to get in the battle. It's time to get in the fight. Like I said, and there's no getting around it anyways. You're already in this. There's already a spiritual warfare going on. You didn't start it. Okay, you're not going to end it. But here we are nonetheless. There is a war going on. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible describes very clearly, you know, when we're talking about warfare, we're not talking about grenade launchers and, you know, guns and ammo and, and, and knives and, and physical fighting. Because those aren't the weapons of our warfare. It's not, it's not about, okay, now you're signed up. Here, you get your battle gear and, and go off and, and shoot somebody. It's not like that at all. Not even close. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal means fleshly, just physical of this world. That is not the weapons of our warfare. It says, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Our battle, our weapons are going to be those of words and thoughts and ideas that come straight from the word of God. This is the fight that we're in. We're trying to reach the hearts and souls and minds of people. That's the, that is where the true power is, by the way. Anyways, it's not, it doesn't come through the barrel of a gun. That's not where true power comes from. True power is going to come through the word of God. That is where true power comes from. And that is why we're facing a time that people are, are and people have always, it's not just this time, people have always been trying to censor and to stop the word of God from being preached. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. This is all just groundwork before I really get into the, uh, the main passage the main point that i want to i want to get across here ephesians chapter six we're just going to see some more verses just regarding the spiritual warfare that we're in and kind of defining the spiritual warfare that it's not just one obscure verse in second timothy that says to be a good soldier of jesus christ there's actually a reference that's brought up multiple times in scripture about us being in a war and being soldiers that uh, this is a way of thinking about your Christian life. Look at verse number 11 in Ephesians chapter 6. And it's talking about putting on armor. Put on the armor of God, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Who puts on armor? Well, soldiers put on armor, right? Knights, you think of a knight in shining armor, right? Those are people, what, what would a knight do, though? A knight is going out and fighting in a battle. Whether, whether it's you're thinking about a knight or whether you're thinking about you know, some other soldier going off to war, they put on armor. I mean, even the police put on their bulletproof vest. That's armor. You put anything that you're putting on to prevent yourself from getting hurt, from getting damaged, that's armor. And the Bible is telling us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because the devil's out to attack. The devil is, is as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. He's walking about as a roaring lion. And again, you didn't have to start that, but by being a born-again child of God, you're in it. And he's looking to devour you. So take stock of where you're at. Let's start putting on some armor. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's again, this isn't a physical warfare. This isn't flesh and blood. This isn't uh, uh, bullets and swords. It says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a lot of, of there's a spiritual warfare going on. And again, this comes at the, at, you know, goes all the way up to the top of the, the real powers in this world. Wicked powers, dark powers, the darkness of this world are, are um, very powerful. And we need to get into the hearts and minds of people in order to stop the work that they're doing, to start to stop the destruction that's being done um, through the spiritual darkness and the wickedness in high places. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand, to, excuse me, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. God wants us to get through this, to get through it. You're not expected to just destroy the devil. And destroy Satan. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to do that. Yeah. We know how it's going to end. So we don't have to worry about being the one that's going to kill Satan. Okay, He's going to do that. He wants us to stand. He just wants us to stand our ground. Stand up. Don't backtrack. Don't backpedal. Okay, let's bring the gospel of God forward. Let's not let ourselves get weary and just 
fall out of the fight and get defeated, okay, it's good enough that you just withstand. And you need to be prepared with the armor of God. You could read the rest of Ephesians chapter 6 later and, and see all the different aspects of the armor of God. I'm not going to get into that this morning. It's a little bit outside of the scope of what I'm preaching on. But turn, if you would, real quick to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And preaching about battle fatigue. And I just wanted to start off by showing you, hey, the Bible talks about Christians being soldiers, that there's this spiritual warfare going on. There's a battle. God needs us to be prepared. We ought to be putting armor on. And we ought not to think that it's strange or that it's weird that you're like, what in the world? Like, like I thought coming to church and you know believing on Jesus, while it is a wonderful thing, while it is a great thing, it's not just going to make your life a bed of roses. It's not just going to mean, wow, everything's just going to work out perfectly now because I'm saved. You know, this is a mindset, unfortunately, that too many people have, that too many people are just real naive in the thinking that, you know, on the one hand, yes, amen, your soul's saved and nothing's ever going to change this. You have comfort and you have rest in that regard. But the, the thing is, with that new birth, even though you're, you're born into that family and nothing could ever change that and you have an inheritance laid up for you in heaven, that's just the beginning of our work here on earth. That's just the beginning. You're just now getting thrown into this battle, and we need to uh, be ready for it and not be offended and, and not, uh, not say, well, this isn't what I signed up for. Look, you're in it. Let's deal with it. First Peter chapter 4, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, Beloved, and I love this just address from Peter. He, I mean, he's saying, look, you're beloved. I love you. Beloved, you know, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, beloved. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. There is a trial coming, and it's going to be fiery. It's not going to be easy. This is something that happens to everybody. He's addressing this to, people, you know, to, the, to the brothers and sisters scattered abroad in 1 Peter. And to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad, he says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Like, wow, what's going on? Why am I going through all this hardship? And see, the, the false prosperity gospel preachers out there are going to tell you, oh, no, you know, God's just going to make everything go great in your life and you're not going to have any problems. That is completely contrary to what the scripture is saying here. He's saying, look, don't be surprised. Don't think it's strange. Oh, wow, what's going on in my life? No, there's going to be fiery trials coming. Verse 13 says, but rejoice. So instead of thinking it's weird and strange, and like, I don't know why this happened, just rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And if you think about this, Jesus Christ, is there any better example that we could look to than the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course not. He is the example for us. And I mean, even the lame, watered down Christianity is going to tell you, oh yeah, you got to follow the steps of Jesus. You got to do this. If you really think about that, Jesus Christ went through some of the worst scourgings and beatings and being crucified on the cross he went through some really fiery trials some really bad times if you're going to be following in christ's steps we can expect that because we're not better than jesus don't say oh yeah well he he said some things he shouldn't have said just to go along to get along he should you know no no let's truly follow jesus steps. if you're following jesus steps look he was martyred you're not any better than he was we can expect at least the same type of treatment by the world, by the people that hate the word of God, because the people that hate the word of God still exist today. They've always existed. They existed in Jesus' time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and these chief priests and, and so many of these wicked Jews that just rejected Christ and rejected the Lord and want to have nothing to do with him. Okay, they killed Jesus. Yeah. And these people are still around today, and it's not just the Jews, it's any wicked people who have rejected God, no matter what religion they ascribe themselves to, they still exist today. They hate God and they hate the fact that you are trying to do a good work here, that you're trying to reach the people of Jacksonville and that you're trying to get souls saved and that you are trying to just shout forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. So don't think it's strange when fiery trials come. Let's keep reading here in 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. 
For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you, and their on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So obviously the Bible's saying here, look, you know, the sufferings that you suffer, they shouldn't be because you've done something wicked. Because you're a murderer or a thief or an adulterer or an evildoer, you know, that's not why you should be suffering. So obviously if you do those things, you're going to suffer and it's not because you're just suffering for Christ. It's because you're, you're reaping what you've sown, you're getting what you deserve. But as Christians, we ought not to suffer like that because that's just going to bring a bad name on Jesus Christ anyways. Uh, you know, people are going to be looking at you as an example. But if you suffer as a Christian, if you suffer because you're doing what's right, if you suffer for making the hard stands that this world is going to condemn you for, hey, that's something to be happy about. That's something not to be ashamed about. When you see one of your brothers and sisters or when you see your pastor or something, you know, being slammed on the news and people are hating on them, you know, don't be ashamed to say, I go to Steadfast, Steadfast Baptist Church. Yeah. You know, don't let that be a, a cause for shame when someone is just getting slammed for making the right stand, for being bold, for preaching the word of God. Stand by. Stand by the men of God. Stand by the people who are, who are with you and working and making the right stand. Don't be ashamed and don't, and don't let that heat that the world's going to bring on you cause you to stop because the pressure is going to be there. And this is, you know, the purpose of preaching a sermon like this this morning is to just help you to get your mind prepared to be ready. And again, I know many of you have already been through a lot. So you, you've gotten to this point and praise God. And here's another thing to think about, you know, if there wasn't a great need and if there wasn't a great work already begun and already started here, you wouldn't be having the attacks. So stay with it. Think of it as a badge of honor that you've had to go through everything you've gotten through to this point to keep on pushing forward because you just got to be ready and say, hey, the experience that we have, let's just keep going forward. We know we're not destroyed by this. We're going to keep moving forward and, and, and not looking back. Let's keep reading here. I'm almost done with 1 Peter chapter 4. Got a bunch more passages I want to look at. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So the Bible is warning us here that um, those that suffer according to the will of God, let's commit our souls to him. In well doing, let's just let's let's trust in the Lord. Have that faith. You know what? God's going to take care of us. God's going to protect us. We don't have to get scared and be fearful about what the enemy can do unto us. The Bible says, "Fear not what man could do unto you." We need to fear God. We need to fear Him that's able to cast both soul and body into hell. And um, we need to just commit ourselves unto serving the Lord. Turn, if you would please, to Second Timothy chapter number three. Second Timothy chapter three, I'm going to start reading verse number 10. It's one more reference to the persecutions that come and go along with serving the Lord. The Bible says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience. Look at verse 11, persecutions, affliction. So this is Apostle Paul writing again to Timothy saying, you've known all about me. Okay, you've known my doctrine, you know the way I am, you know my manner of life, you know all these things about me, you know the persecutions that I've had to endure, you know the afflictions that have come on me, it says, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, so he's li listing off all these various places that all of these various persecutions have happened unto him. He says, but what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So I face persecutions in Antioch, Iconium, I've had persecutions here, I've had all these problems, but you know what? Out of every single one of those trials, those tribulations, those persecutions, God delivered me out of all of them. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, at the time, it's easier to look back and say, hey, look what God did. But when you're going through it, it's a lot harder, 
right? I mean, that's, and this is why we're preaching this morning, because, you know, you may not be facing anything at the moment. Things might be going great, but you got to remember when the hard times come to stay focused, to keep your eyes set on the prize, to look at the words of the Apostle Paul and say, look, I've been through all of these various afflictions, persecutions, but you know what? God is able to deliver, and he has delivered, and he will show himself true and faithful every single time. God will not fail you. Look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That word will, it means basically you want to. Okay, that's your will. It's what you want to do, what you desire to do. So the Bible says if you want to live godly in Christ Jesus, hopefully we're surrounded by a bunch of people that want to live godly in Christ Jesus. Amen? I, I want to live godly in Christ Jesus. This is what I want to do. I want to follow the word of God. I want to obey God. I want to do what's going to make God pleasing. I want to spread the word of God. That's what I want to do. And if you want to do the same thing, the Bible says you shall suffer persecution. It doesn't say you might. It doesn't say you may. It says you shall. So be ready for it. You, are, you will suffer persecution because you want to live a godly life, because you want to live according to the way that the Bible says. But we can be comforted. Even though you know that persecutions will happen, hey, God's able to deliver out of all of them. Turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Just flip a few pages back in your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And I want you to keep this in mind, too, that the Christian life it's a war. It's not just one battle. You may have one hard battle, one hard fight in your life, and then it finally ends like, man, I'm glad that's over. Don't expect that to be the last one. Okay, there's a series of battles in wars. Now, it doesn't mean that every single day of your life you're going to be persecuted. You're going to have your ups and downs. You're going to have your time where things are going pretty smooth and you got some smooth sailing, but then there's going to be times where the attacks come. And you're not going to know necessarily when those attacks come. You just need to be ready for them so that it doesn't knock you out of the fight altogether, so that one battle doesn't end the war for you personally. I'm going to read from Galatians 6 for you. You're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Another reason that we could be looking forward to and that can help get you through the trials and the tribulations and persecutions is that there's going to be a time of reaping. Okay, When your short life ends and when Jesus Christ comes back, Jesus Christ is going to set up his judgment seat and he's going to mete out rewards based on what you've done with your life. So all of the fights, all of the battles, you put on, he sees you put on the armor of God, you've stood and withstood the evildoers, you've withstood the devil, you've withstood Satan, and you preach the word of God, and you've done what he has asked you to do. He's going to hand out rewards, and you're going to get eternal rewards, eternal lasting rewards from Jesus Christ. The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing. Don't, don't get, get tired of it. Don't, you know, I know it's work. Well-doing is work. Going out soul winning is work. Living the righteous life is work. Resisting the sins and the temptations is work. It's hard. It's not easy to do. But don't get weary. Don't faint. Stay at it because you're going to be able to reap. All the hard work you're putting in, all the plowing that you're doing, you're going to be able to reap. And that is what it's all about. You're going to be able to reap and enjoy and have an eternity of, of rewards that you've reaped. The Bible says in verse 10, of Galatians 6, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's start reading in verse number 12. The Bible reads, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And this is talking about people in Thessalonica. The church of Thessalonica had a problem with some people that were busybodies, that wouldn't work. They were going about and, and being tail bearers and busybodies and not just working and eating their own bread. They were relying on other people to take care of them. And this was a problem that, that they were experiencing. And uh, look down at verse number 13. The Bible says, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. There's that phrase again. Hey, you just need to keep doing what's right. Yeah, going to work is hard. You know, doing the right thing is not easy. But don't be weary in that well-doing. Verse 14, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. 
Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you all. And the reason why I brought up this passage is because, you know, there's going to be trials and tribulations and persecution, but there's also going to be other hard times that in order for you to do well, it's not going to be pleasant. And in this situation, this is talking about someone being put away from fellowshipping with because they're wicked, because they're doing wicked things. First Corinthians chapter five gives a whole list of different things that people can do. Other brothers and sisters in Christ can actually do to where we're going to separate from them and say, you know what? I'm not even going to eat with you. I'm not going to have anything to do with you until you repent, until you get right with God, until you get out of that sin. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And it's a tough love that you need to show people. And it's not easy. It's called tough love. It's not just tough on them. It's tough on you. It's not always easy to make that choice. What's easier is just to look the other way and just pretend like nothing's wrong and that there's no problem. That's the easier thing to do. The harder thing to do is just to stand up and be like, no. Hey, what you're doing is wicked. Hey, you ought to get to work. Don't be begging everyone else for money. You're an able-bodied man. Get to work, man. Stop getting involved in everyone else's business. Put your nose down and just work hard. And in this situation, second, second, excuse me, second uh, Thessalonians chapter three, we've got people not working. They're being busybodies. They're gossiping. They're spreading rumors. Like, look, man, just get to work. I'm not going to have anything to do with you until you get right with God. And we need to not be weary in well doing. Let's not get you know like, oh man, this is happening again. Oh, there's more. Look, it's going to continue to happen. Get used to it. There's going to be people that are going to come in and try to split churches and cause division amongst the body here. You got a local body of people trying to serve the Lord and you need to be in this body in unity. But you also need to keep a proper standard where you see some really wicked things going on to be able to put your foot down and say, you know what? The Bible says we shouldn't tolerate this. We're not going to tolerate this. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's a wicked person coming every other week or every year or however often it happens, we're not going to get weary in well-doing. This is the stand that we need to take because it's what the Word of God says. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to just go along to get along and make sure, you know, that, that no one feels uncomfortable. Because, look, these things, they, they do make you feel uncomfortable. It's not easy. You know, I don't really enjoy fighting. I don't enjoy, you know, the battle, but it's where we are. Whether, whether you really like it or not, it doesn't mean that you're always just under this severe persecution. It's not the way your entire life will be. But when it comes, don't just skirt away from it. Be able to be strong and do the right thing. And don't get a bad attitude about these attacks. Turn if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Don't get a bad attitude about the attacks, even if they seem to come regularly. And what we're going to see in 2 Corinthians 11 is what the Apostle Paul had to endure. He gives a list of all these various things that he went through and that he did uh, when he was on this earth and when he was, when he was doing the work of the Lord. If you want some encouragement about not getting weary when, when strifes happen, when, when problems arise, when battles come up, just think about the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to start reading in verse number 23. The Bible says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. The Paul, was Paul a hard worker? You better believe he's a hard worker. The Bible says that you know, he went to these places. He went to the church of Thessalonica, and he didn't take any money from that church at all because he was trying to show them, especially the people who were, who were guilty of not working at all, that you know what? You could serve God, and you could provide for yourself 100%. You can, you can work hard. You can work day and night. You know, you could, you could do a day job. You could still serve the Lord. You could still preach the gospel. You can get it all done. You just have to work real hard at it. It's labor. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you your time, but you're going you know, to you're gonna have to do it. And you know what? He did that. He was a great example under the believers. This is how you do it. You're going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to get to work, and I'm also going to minister unto you, and I'm going to spend and be spent for you. That's the, the heart and the attitude of the Apostle Paul. He had lots of labors. Labor is more abundant. He labored more. And, and this is, you know, he's kind of comparing himself to people who are trying to, to prop themselves up as being somebody, right? Because they're bringing the Apostle Paul down. And he's trying to remind them of all the things that he's gone through. 
He says, in stripes above measure. What's a stripe? A stripe is a whip from a beating. Stripe is, is, a, is literally a stripe of blood that you receive from being whipped, from being beaten. He's like, above measure. I can't even count how many stripes I've received. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths. Oh, that, was, you know, that always just stands out to me. In you know, he's like, I've died. And yeah, God's brought him back. Right? He, got, he was able to do his work. In deaths off. Not like even just one time. He's like, this is a common thing. Look, I'm, I'm facing so much persecution. I'm getting thrown into jail. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working. I've got these stripes and I'm dying. Yeah, I still get up and keep going. I mean, I'm, I don't know what it would feel like to die because I've never died before. <laughs> but I can't imagine it feels good. It's probably not one of those pleasant things that have happened to you, right? Have someone stone you with stones to the point of death. And then, you know, God miraculously brings you back to life. And then like, all right, well, let's, let's keep going. Let's, let's, let's keep working at it, okay? This is the Apostle Paul. But that's one verse. He keeps going on here. Look at verse number 24. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. I, I believe this is in addition to the other stripes that he was receiving. He's like, he, you know, that was above measure. This time, the Jews, they whipped me five times. With 40 stripes, save one. 39 stripes every single time. 39 lashes, five times. Verse number 25, thrice was I beaten with rods. I don't want to get beaten with rods one time. He's beaten with rods three times. Once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And, you know, I don't want to get too, you know, too far into this. But when you read these verses, just try to put yourself in the situations being a night and a day, just, just like shipwreck, floating in the water, what would happen to your body, just, just how, you know, soft your skin gets and, you know, if there's salt water or whatever, just, just how much that, how terrible that would be to endure something like that. This is just one thing on this list. And these are all these trials and persecutions and tribulations that he suffered because he's doing the work of the Lord. So this isn't just he's on vacation and something bad happened to him. No, these are, these are all things he's listing as being a servant of Christ that have happened to him along the way through the fight. He's dealt with all of these various things. Verse number um, 26, in journeyings often, so he's always on the road, he's traveling in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. He's like, basically, there's this danger. It's dangerous everywhere he's going. It doesn't matter if he's around his own people. It doesn't matter if he's in a foreign city. It doesn't matter if he's in the sea. It doesn't matter if it's the heathen. You know, he's always just facing danger. Verse 27, in weariness and painfulness. And he's talking about physically. I mean, he's, being, he's just tired. He's, he's going through this. He's getting worn out and he's, he's experiencing pain in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. These are all of these external things that are coming upon him as he's serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 28 says, Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. It's not an easy job to take care of all these churches, what he was doing. He was traveling around, he was preaching the gospel, he was helping churches get planted and started up. And then on top of that, he's caring for these people. He's writing letters to them, he's praying for them, you know, he's thinking about them, he's, he's circling back around and traveling and trying to encourage them and teach them and minister unto all these churches. I'm doing all this stuff. That's a weariness. That's also something that's, that's not easy to do. Verse 29, he says, who is weak and I am not weak. You want to complain to me and tell me about how hard it is and how hard your life is? You think I'm not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? He says, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. But all of these things he's listing, though, even though they're not easy, even though it's hard, he's saying, look, I've been through all these things. God's the one who gets the credit for bringing me through this. But when, when you're worried about, if you're thinking about how hard your life is and how hard the Christian life is, look what the Apostle Paul went through. I don't think there's anybody here today that's probably going to face these things in your Christian life, in your Christian walk. Probably not. Probably not mine. I think we got it really easy, especially in the climate that we still have today. Yes, things are going worse, 
but it's still very easy to serve God in the United States of America. And unfortunately, people have gotten too soft into not doing more to serve God, especially when it's so easy to do, when you really don't face the amount of tribulation and persecution that the Apostle Paul had to face. We're not being arrested and whipped and stoned and beaten the way that the Apostle Paul was, the way that the Jews hated Christ then and were able to do these things unto him, the power that they had to do all that stuff. We don't, they, we don't have to worry about those types of things today. Let's use the time that you have to serve Christ to the utmost. And when you think things are getting hard, when you think things are being tough, when you think it's difficult, think about how much worse it could be. And people have still been able to serve God through all of that. It should be a cakewalk for us. It really should. Now, obviously, we know we're going to, you know, I don't want to downplay persecutions that you have, but, but if you're considering getting out and just quitting, and, oh, this is too much for me, Look at how much more other people have been able to go through and try to draw some strength and encouragement from that and say, well, if they were able to do all of that, maybe I can stick with it a little bit longer. Maybe I could just keep going a little bit more and continue to serve God. Yeah, I don't like all the fighting. Yeah, I don't like all the drama. You know what? Nobody likes it. No one enjoys it, but it's part of the Christian life. It's part of what happens when you do a great work. It's, it's one of the things that just will happen. People are going to come and try to destroy the work. They're going to try to destroy the church. They're going to cause division. It just is what it is. It's going to happen. And that's just a sign that you're having an impact when people come after you like that. Turn, if you would, to heat. Well, turn, if you would, to... You're in 2 Corinthians 11. Just flip back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So we're going to read Hebrews chapter 12 for you. I'll just read these verses real quick. You know, we looked at Paul as an example, but we could also look to Jesus Christ as well, obviously. In verse number 1 in Hebrews 12, the Bible reads, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You could think about Jesus Christ and what he went through. Jesus Christ, the contradiction of sinners against himself. Here you have the perfect man, the Son of God, you know, the Son of God who left his glory that he had with the Father in heaven, he left that to come to this earth and to take on a human form, a human body, and be born as a child, as a, you know, to humble himself to that point, to that degree, to just be born as an infant, to, have, to literally have other human beings caring for you and for your health and your well-being and going through life here and doing everything right, doing everything perfect, and then having... Your very creation turning on you and many people, you know, despising you and spitting on you and mocking you when all you've done is good. When all you've done is help people, minister people, preach the truth and try to just convince people, hey, serve the Lord. God's true. God's righteous. You know, love him. Put your faith on the Lord. All of these things, all he did was right, yet he still endured yet he still kept going he says you know the bible says don't be wearied and faint in your minds look to jesus for the strength you haven't resisted unto blood striving against sin jesus christ did we we haven't resisted to that here you're in second corinthians chapter seven we see an example here of brethren Believers being comforted in their tribulation. Look at verse number 4, 2 Corinthians 7. The Bible reads, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down 
comforted us by the coming of Titus. And I, I know you guys have a lot of, of different preachers and pastors coming into your church. And I pray that you'll be comforted by all these different people that are going to come in and spend time with you and help teach and instruct because this is something that, uh, that the Bible uses very frequently, actually. You could see um, churches of like mind, of like faith, having different preachers sent and teaching and preaching in various churches. This is something that happened in all the early churches in the book of Acts. And you can read these epistles. You know, yes, the Apostle Paul was planting churches, but he wasn't the only one preaching to these places. He was, you know, there was other people coming. There was other preachers from Antioch, from Jerusalem. They were going to various churches and they were coming and teaching. And he says here that, um, that he was comforted, comforted us by the coming of Titus, just by Titus showing up, another laborer, a fellow laborer in the Lord, someone else who's doing the work, someone else who's a soldier, someone else who's standing up, coming in and being an encouragement, said, hey, we were comforted by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. So going to another place, going to Macedonia, going to Corinth, and seeing the brethren there, hey man, we're still serving the Lord, we're still going strong, that's a comfort not just to the person who's coming, but to, you know, to the church as well. You can both mutually be comforted by the coming of the people who are, who are there. The Apostle Paul loves hearing the good reports. That's an encouragement for him. And, um, you know, the more that you do well, it's going to be a comfort unto others also. He says, wherewith, uh, verse 7, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoiced the more. They were a blessing to the Apostle Paul because he loved them, because he cares for them, just in them doing well, just in them receiving Titus and, uh, and, and doing well with him. Almost done here. Last place I'm going to turn. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. So last place I'm going to have you turn. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Just like we saw Titus being sent and, and providing comfort, not only to the people he was sent to, but also to, uh, to others, to the Apostle Paul, we're going to see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Timotheus basically having a similar thing happen here. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. So they're worried about the church. They're worried about these people. They're saying, you know, we thought it'd be good to just stay at Athens. And he's, he's writing to Thessalonians. And he's saying, you know, we decided to stay here because there's more work that needs to be done. We need to do this. But we decided to send Timothy. Because Timothy needs to be an encouragement unto you. Timothy needs to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith because we don't want you being moved or upset by the afflictions that they're going through, right? That the church is going through as well as the Apostle Paul. You know, they're hearing about these things going on and, and all the trials and tribulations. He's like, I, we don't want you guys to be offended by that. We don't want you to be shaken in your faith because all these bad things, these seemingly bad things are happening, you know, we're going to send Timotheus so that you can be comforted, so that you can just be strengthened and settled and, and, uh, and, and continue to move forward and that you wouldn't allow any of these things that happen to, to offend your faith. That no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Verse number four, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. He said, we already warned you about this. We told you about this. Now it's happening, so don't be surprised. It's not some strange thing that's happening. It's a fiery trial. This is going to happen. And how many times the Apostle Paul warns. You could read through all the epistles. He's warning churches. He's warning about false brethren. He's warning about the false prophets. He's warning about trials and tribulations because we need to be ready because we don't want to lose anyone in this spiritual fight. We need all as many people as possible to, to stand firm, to stand strong, to be ready, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to do the work of the Lord. We definitely don't need less. We need more. And that's all the more reason why coming to church is so important as well. Bible says in Hebrews 10, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, 
but so much the more as you see the day approaching. And um, before that, the Bible says that we need that we're here for the um, for the edification of the church. The Bible says, excuse me, in verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together. We're supposed to provoke one another and be there to be an encouragement unto love and to good works to stay in the fight, to keep doing good, to keep doing right. It's important to get in that church and, and be there to help encourage, love one another, care about one another. Don't just show up, say hi, and go home. You know, you ought to know everybody here. You ought to, you ought to know what's going on in their lives. Be an encouragement. Be uh, there to help and provide support because everybody that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not just you. It's going to be everyone around you. So be that support for the people, especially those real close around you within this church. Verse number five here in 1 Thessalonians chapter three, the Bible reads, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. The care of the brethren, the care of the saints is one of the things that can provide comfort when you hear about things that are going well. Think about the great works that the Apostle Paul was doing and that these other men of God were doing. He's saying, you know, in our hard times, when things are coming down real hard on us, because they're human beings too. Okay, we look to them as examples because they're good examples, but they had to go through stuff like you go through. They had to go through, and you know, we saw they went through even more stuff, but they're people. They experience the same type of temptations that you do. You, you, you want to tell me Apostle Paul wasn't tempted to just quit? Just get out. Of course he was tempted, but he stuck with it, which is why we looked at him for an example. But one of the sources that he was able to draw comfort from is knowing that, hey, these other churches are serving God. You know, we were worried about you, so we sent Timotheus unto you. But you know what? Timotheus brought back a really good report. You're still in it. You're still in the fight. You're still going strong. Hey, that's an encouragement. That makes it all worth it for the Apostle Paul to continue going and to do even more. When you hear about hey, this great work wasn't destroyed. It's still remaining. It's still continuing to go. That provides comfort. Don't forget the blessing of being a blessing to other people, being encouragement to other people when you get tempted to drop out of the fight, to drop out of church, to stop coming. I'll tell you personally, as a pastor of a church, I care about every single person in, a, in my local church. Every single person that comes, you know, some people, whether they come once a month, whether they come to every service, I care about all the people that attend our church. And when one person is missing, it bothers me. Okay, And, and it's not that, you know, I, I, I don't just like helicopter over them, and, oh, where were you? But I, I, I care, it's because I care about people, right? I, and, and you can see sometimes people that kind of fade out and they're starting to, you know, drift away. Look, you care about those people. It's an encouragement to me. You want to be an encouragement to your pastor, stay with it. Don't just think, you know, it kind of gets a little selfish minded to say, oh, well, I don't want to have to deal with this. But now you're not just impacting yourself or your family. You're also going to be impacting others around you. And even if it's not the pastor, maybe it's just some other family, someone else, some other friend that you have in church where you're kind of helping each other and comforting each other. You know, now when you're gone, they're going to be lacking. So don't forget about other people as well. And when you're staying in the fight, and this is the great thing about the job that God has for us, is that it truly is a ministry. It's never about self-promotion. It's not about how good you can be and have everybody look at you. The best person in, in Christianity is going to be the servant and minister of all. Your, your, your whole job and focus should be caring about other people. That is the mindset that we need to have. So when you're thinking about times being tough for you, don't focus on your troubles and your persecutions. Be focused on other people because that's also going to lessen the impact that those, those hard times will have on you because you're not focused on your own sufferings and your own pain. You're focused on other people. And well, how can I still be a blessing to someone else even through all this? How about I can help make a good example so that other people can look to me and be encouraged by this? 
and still continue to go strong. It's not about you. The comfort goes on both sides. I love visiting churches. I love vis- I, I've, I've really appreciated the fact I've been able to travel a little bit more recently and go visit other churches of like-minded believers and get a chance to meet people because I see the same spirit. The same spirit of God working in the people here as there is at our church, as there is at other churches I visited, where you've got a good unity, you've got a good brother, and you've got people who love the Lord and want to serve him. You know what? That encourages me quite a bit. We saw what happened with Elijah. I mean, multiple times he brings up the fact that he thinks he's all alone. Now, he wasn't all alone. There were other people that believed, but he felt like he was all alone. And that made his job that much harder because nobody was willing to stand with him. But when, when you can go and even visit other places and go to different states and go to different churches and you see, wow, here's other people who are serving the Lord. Praise the God. It's an encouragement. That's a blessing. And that is something that we all need because we're part of a battle. We're in a war. And there's going to be hard times. So we need the encouragement as much as possible from one another. I want to try to be a blessing. I'm only in town here for a short period of time, but I want to be a blessing to all of you here today and, and try to give you some encouragement. And, and hopefully we can stay refreshed. We can get refreshed, stay in the battle, and just keep pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for all the lessons that we can learn, dear God. I pray that you please strengthen this church, strengthen Steadfast Baptist Church, dear Lord. I pray that you please help the people here continue to grow and to do good and, and to serve you in, in all um, honesty and sincerity and fear, dear Lord. And I pray that you would just bless this church, strengthen everybody here. Lord, I pray that you would just, um, just help supply anything that's, that might be lacking and wanting, dear Lord, and that you would um, just just... Help bless this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.